Welcome to my presentation, Birth of a Technology, Drivewire and its Impact. My name is Boise Pete and I'm going to talk to you today more as a storyteller, a raconteur. I'm not going to really get into too much technical de depth unless the questions go that direction, but I want to give you a story of a technology and how it grew and changed over the years. I think you'll find it somewhat interesting. How many of you have heard of Drivewire before or used it? A few people? So. Never have. So obviously the first question is what is drive wire? And to set that answer up, I'm going to show you this picture here. This is a Coco 3 sitting on a desk with a, uh, not a multi-pack, but a sim similar type of technology. And on the right is the floppy drive. We all know what five and a quarter inch floppy drives are. So uh, the floppy drive is pretty much, it's available as a product you can find on eBay, but finding floppy disks, even 10, 15 years ago was starting to get hard. Now it's getting really, really difficult. It's a legacy technology, um, you know. And so we knew it was eventually gonna fall off the wayside. <clears throat> so DriveWire eliminates the floppy drive by taking a color computer, a cable, serial cable, and a modern computer. I have an iMac here, but this could easily be PC, Linux box, or even a Raspberry Pi. And it takes the floppy disk out of the equation and it makes the PC or the Mac or the Raspberry Pi the server that serves up disk sectors to the Coco. So you get away from using the physical floppy drive and you replace it with literally the hard drive on the modern computer. So DriveWire is both a protocol and a product. And of course, bits just travel on the wire. That's basically what you're doing. You're just changing the medium. So when you look at what drive wire does, the benefits it brings, obviously it does away with the dependence uh, on the floppy, which is a good thing because floppies were going away at the time. The performance is pretty much on par with the floppy, not in some cases not quite as good, but when you average things out, it's not too bad. The big thing about drive wire was that it was a very minimum investment. Floppy drives back in the 80s and even the 90s were not too cheap. They were getting cheaper, but you know, cost a lot of money. So you literally could just put, you know, $10, $15 together for a cable, load some software, and you were ready to go as long as you had a computer on the other end to service the server. <clears throat> and of course, the disk images, which is the raw a representation of the floppy disk was on the on the server for easy access. You could email disk images, archive them, very, very easy. So uh, let's talk about how this all got started. I'm going to use a title from my favorite Emerson, Lake, and Palmer song, From the Beginning. You guys like that group? That's an awesome song, by the way. So I think the story of DriveWire is best told using a timeline. Uh, to show kind of the important milestones, and this is broken down into 11 events, probably a few more that I could have added, but over the span of 27 years, it all started in 1995 at a Cocoa Fest in Chicago. This is an ad for a product called HS Link, and if any of you Cocoa guys might remember this, it was pretty obscure. There was a gentleman by the name of Chris Decker who exhibited at Cocoa Fest back in the mid-90s. Maybe, Brian, you remember Chris? Yeah, and he had this product, I remember it sitting on the, on the table, it was a, a, a x86, maybe a 386 at the time, running, uh, it wasn't running any particular special software, maybe just a terminal program, but what was really impressive is that he was connecting the Coco 3, running OS 9 level 2 at the time, over the Bitbanger port, which is the four pin serial port on the back of the Coco, and running at baud rates of 38.4 and 57.6 bits, uh, kilobits per second. And that was pretty amazing because, well, I thought at the time, uh, you know, everybody said all oh, the, the bid banger port on the Coco can only go 300 baud reliably and all this kind of jazz. Well, that's true to a certain degree, <clears throat> but I was intrigued by the fact that he could get, the, get those kind of speeds and only as I started looking into it later, I realized how it was doing it. But anyway, this is where the idea for drive wire for me began, is the, you know, how can I take advantage of this seemingly slow port and make it faster and use it as some type of a transport mechanism for data. 
Then about five years later, uh, or uh, actually seven years later, in 2002, I signed an agreement with Joe Shenta from uh, Kenton Electronics. He developed a hard drive interface for the Coco, a SCSI interface, to transfer the ownership of a product called RGB DOS, which was a disk operating system for the Coco 3 and Coco 2 and Coco 1, uh, to me. So we made a, an agreement. And um, it turns out that even before I had envisioned DriveWire, this transaction would be serendipitous and would come back later to be a really good. Uh, really good decision. So I renamed RGB DOS to HDB DOS, which stood for Hard Drive Basic, and uh, began to enhance it, but at the time it only talked to SCSI drives. I think I later with Cloud9's help I uh, brought it over to work with IDE drives on the Coco as well. <clears throat> now we come to 2003. So now it's eight years since I saw the HS Link demo at the Rain uh, Chicago Coco Fest at Chris Decker's table. And um, you may be familiar with the quote, uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. That actually comes from this quote by Plato in, uh, in uh, one of his uh, Aesop's fables, our need will be the real creator. And that's kind of where DriveWire came in, is that I needed something to solve a particular problem, and from that eventually became a product. And I find that a lot of products become products out of needs to solve one person's need, but then when you realize other people have that same problem, their needs turn into opportunities for you. At the time in 2003, I was working, uh, traveling a lot back and forth to Boston, Massachusetts from a home in Louisiana, and was working with Cloud9, Mark back at the table, um, and I was bringing my cocoa back and forth with me, but I didn't want to carry a floppy drive in my luggage because it would have gotten banged up by uh, the airline, obviously. Uh, hard drive, uh, floppy drives are just very sensitive, head movements and stuff, misalignments could be also problematic. So I began to think about a way to engineer a solution that I could use my, at the time, my G4 PowerBook, right, which was what I was toting for work, uh, to, the, to the particular work I was doing, <coughs> excuse me, instead of a floppy drive. I happen to be staying in this cottage here called uh, Georgie's Cottage out in Sudbury, Massachusetts also known as Wilbur's Cabin. And um, it was in that little cottage of that red door that I started working on DriveWire. I uh, worked on it all uh, in the summer of 2003, prototyped the server running on the Mac at the time, wrote the code in 6809 assembly on the Coco, and eventually got a semblance of a product, but I wasn't quite ready to sell it. So about a year later, or early in 2004, I'd say not a year, but maybe nine months, eight months in, I decided to market this because at the time Mark and I were working together and I said, hey Mark, try this idea out. He liked it. We started putting a package together and we called it DriveWire 2. So DriveWire 2 ran on a Cocoa 1 and 2 at 38.4 kilobits per second or on a Cocoa 3 at 57.6 kilobits per second. Uh, it ran under Disk Basic, which HDB DOS, which I had acquired earlier, I used that as my uh, mechanism for delivering the functionality of DriveWire in that environment. And then for, at the time, OS 9, which became Nitrous 9 and was transitioning to an open source kind of model at that point, I wrote the drivers for OS 9, for Nitrous 9, for the Cocoa 6809 for DriveWire, and so begin to uh, market it. Ironically, it required a floppy drive to set it up, and that's kind of a unfortunate thing that I would address later through the, uh, through the uh, introduction of a DriveWire ROM pack, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. But anyway, it was one of those things. People still had floppy drives. In fact, the, the use case for DriveWire back then was people wanted to take data off their real floppies and move it over to their server. So it was almost assumed that you'd have a floppy disk at that point. So we began selling it in 2004 through Cloud9. The software I sold for $30, you got a, a floppy disk with the HDB DOS and Nitrous 9 drivers, a CD-ROM with the Mac and Windows server software that I had written. I wrote both. Actually, it was a Linux server, but I'll show you in a second. The hardware costs were cheap. The cable cost $10. Uh, we sold it for that for a long time, Mark, I believe. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And later, like I said, I introduced a ROM pack so that if you wanted to literally take your Cocoa without a floppy drive, you shove the ROM pack with the HDB Dawson ROM on it, connect the cable from your Cocoa to your PC, and boom, you were running. You were booting into OS 9 or you were using it under Disk Basic. And if you were using even a PC back in 2004, unless it was a stationary desktop, if it was a notebook, you probably needed a USB to serial cable. All told, the potential cost could run from $65 to $85. Still a lot cheaper than a floppy drive, right? And still, the media was getting harder and harder to find. The first DriveWire server I wrote was in C. It's still on GitHub. And this is a screen capture of it. Uh, it uses the Curses library. So it was very, very portable, very easy to use. You set up your files. Your disk zero would be a file. Or disk one, disk two, disk three would be simply a file on your, on your, on your PC. You type in the file name. You set the Cocoa type for the baud rate. And then you could see the, the drive wire protocol transactions at the top there as things uh, would go forward. So we were often running to the races. <coughs> Excuse me. But there was still some improvement to be made. And that's where DriveWire 3 came in in 2005. So DriveWire 3, uh, again, sold via Cloud9, incorporated some improved routines from a gentleman by the name of Darren Atkinson, who was gracious enough to provide some improvements. It kept the Cocoa 1 still at 30.4 kilobits, 30 kilobits per second, but it kicked the Cocoa 2 up to 57.6 kilobits per second, and the Cocoa 3 running double at 115.2 kilobits per second. So we got double the throughput um, on those two systems. We got rid of the requirement of having a floppy disk to set up the operating, uh, to set up HDB DOS. We also added printing support. So <clears throat> if you had a printer hooked up to your PC, you could print from the Coco to the PC, and of course it would print to the PC's printer, so you could get hard copies that way. Sort of a virtual uh, routing system. <clears throat> I had defined at the time, and I partially implemented it, but never completed a remote debugging specification, so you could in theory, run a debugger on your PC or your Mac and single step through code on the Cocoa and the drive or our protocol would control that through software interrupts to go to the next instruction stop and so forth and give you the, give you the, the stack and the register contents. But that protocol is defined. Uh, again, DriveWire 3 for Disk Basic used HDB DOS, uh, partitioned into uh, the system into 256 virtual floppies and it was very easy, well, easy to use. There were some uh, intricacies in terms of switching back and forth between using a real floppy disk and a drive wire, virtual floppy disk, but it worked pretty good, and it allowed a lot of people to just go and download disk images and start loading them up. What was particular interesting, inter particularly interesting for me as an OS 9 guy was um, the Nitrous 9 uh, code. I was really happy with this. Um, OS 9, of course, is the multitasking operating system that the color computer runs because it's a 6809-based system. Uh, really took advantage of the architecture of OS 9 to make the drive wire product very, very, uh, very modular. So uh, that even exists today now in Nitrous 9. Uh, that, that organization is still there. I also took the opportunity to improve the server situation. I wrote a... Uh, uh, a GUI-based Mac server in Objective-C for the Mac, and then I wrote a Windows server. Uh, it looks very similar uh, in uh, Delphi, which is a Pascal-based language for, uh, for the Windows system. And as Mark can attest, he still uses that product today, the, the DriveWire 3 server. So it was things were starting to open up. People were starting to use DriveWire more, starting to uh, buy it more, and it was becoming more of a entrenched part of the Cocoa experience. In 2008, uh, Mark and I had talked about this. We decided to open source DriveWire at the time. Um, it was a fun project, made a little bit of money on it, but support was kind of a, an ongoing issue and I didn't have a lot of time. So I was like, you know what, let's just give it away. And we did that. Uh, we open sourced HDB DOS as well. We open sourced the OS 9 drivers. <laughs> and that folded in quite nicely with, uh, with the Nitrous 9 open source project. So why did we open source it? We wanted to promote DriveWire as a standard. It was already kind of becoming that way. People were using it a lot, and we wanted to see that growth continue organically, and we wanted to say thanks to the Cocoa community. So it turned out to be a pretty good decision for us. 
Then in 2010, uh, the, there used to be, and I think it's still going, right, John, the Retro Challenge? Yeah. It was a winter retro challenge, I think, in 2010, where you, people get together and come up with ideas, and you know, there's a winner. So myself, a gentleman by the name of Aaron Wolf, and Jim Hathaway, another guy, uh, decided we would add networking, TCP IP networking to the COCO through Nitrous 9. And we did that by extending the drive wire protocol to do networking. So really the networking was taking place again on the PC, not on, on the COCO itself, but drive wire was the intermediary and we were abstracting out sockets on the, uh, on the server through using an OS9, something called a virtual networking device script. It was really kind of cool, but the heavy lifting was on the PC. So we actually won that challenge first place. I don't even think we got anything except some kudos, but in the process of doing that, Aaron, um, who was very active in the COCO at the time, wrote a Java-based server called DriveWire 4. So the protocol for DriveWire didn't really change other than the addition of the added protocols, uh, commands for networking, but uh, Aaron did write a very elegant and beautiful server in Java. And uh, that's, those are the, kind of the screen images. Quite easy to use. Uh, ran on, of course, since it was Java, it wrote on all, ran on all platforms without being language specific. Um, uh, so anyway, that's the link to it. Unfortunately, Java has changed so much and versions have changed that yeah, the, the code really didn't get updated and now it's really a headache to get uh, going, I understand. But for someone ambitious, it could still be a, a task taken uh, by someone to do that. So DriveWire 4 comes in 2010. And then in 2012, <clears throat> I embarked on another side project for an interest that I had been wanting to do called the Liberate 09. I took a 6809 and I made a board and I wanted to stick it in an Atari 8-bit computer like the Atari 65XC or 130. And I did that. I called it the Liberate 09. And I actually ported OS 9 to it. Uh, you could see an Atari running OS 9, it's an actual eight, Atari 8-bit with the 6809 and it, removing the 6502. And I used DriveWire for that. So I was able to repurpose the protocol, write a client for, uh, for the OS, well, it was already written for OS 9, but sort of rewrite the boot code and so forth because I had to change the ROM in the Atari for B6809. And that further uh, proved out that DriveWire was, a, was, a, was an interesting technology to continue to develop. So at this point, the community has been using DriveWire for a while. It's becoming more of a staple. It's been on open source for a number of years. In 2007, a guy by the name of Mike Furman, who was a part of the Cocoa community, came out with a Python version of a DriveWire server, which was really nice. It's like, well, okay, we've already maintained uh, platform superiority and homogeny by uh, putting it in Java, but then that fell off the way because of the changes that we were seeing in Java. Python was the next uh, natural progression of that. And uh, you can visit the GitHub site for that today. And Mike did a, a really good job. And a lot of people surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I should say, but happily so are running the Pi DriveWire server as their experience for using DriveWire. So uh, kudos to Mike Furman for, um, for making that available. In 2019, in fact, at the last Tandy assembly that we had, I met Matt uh, Boytum in the back, and Matt showed me a, uh, yes, there, Matt just waved his hand there. Matt took the DriveWire server that I had written for Windows and uh, was using it to boot, drive, to, I don't know if you were booting it LS-DOS, Matt, or you were just using it to serve up disk images for LS? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, still booting from floppy, but I was really impressed with that because what baud rate did you have to set that to? I think 192 was the highest baud that the uh, Model 130 for those So remember the uh, Coco 2 or the Coco 1, the lowest baud was 38.4 kilobits. So uh, Matt went in the in the in the code and I guess found the offset and tickled it and got the baud rate, even though it still said 38.4 and it had an image of a Coco, he was, it was pretty impressive. So I was very happy that he did that. So again, it shows that again, the utility of this technology is that it can be used anywhere or on other computers. So we're at 2021, DriveWire has been entrenched in the community for years now. I uh, 
did a project here uh, called Ghidorah, which is a, uh, it's a way of connecting multiple cocos together over bid bangers and uh, sort of, uh, it's a token ring is what it is, basically a serial based token ring using the same bid banger code routines that I use for drive wire. Uh, using cooperative message passing, you can literally put a PC on the ring, have three or four cocos connected around, and you can tell each coco to load up code and to execute or to do whatever you want, and it's really cool. So anyway, that was another kind of uh, derivative of the drive wire protocol that uh, that I that I used for. So you can visit uh, that link there as well. Um, so we've gone through the uh, uh, twenty something years of drive wire and. I guess the moral of the story of this presentation is that you never know how your creation might impact the world, whether that is the, the cocoa world or your retro computing world. And um, uh, I, we didn't, I, I didn't, if I could go back in time and see what DriveWire was when I created it, remember I created it in a cottage in Massachusetts for a singular need, and now 27 years later, this is what it's doing. So when you come up with an idea, you never know where it's going to take you. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, so when DriveWire was introduced, there were people using disk images mostly for, at that time, I guess, the Vavasar emulators. Oh. I don't even know if there were any other emulators of merit at that point, but uh, mostly for emulators. Now, uh, DriveWire uh, is not the only game in town. There's a uh, technology, specifically the Coco STC, oh. the Dragon MMC is a similar thing. There's a couple other technologies out there for serving um, for replacing floppy disks mm -hmm. uh, with SEC cards or whatever, but they're based around disk images. And in the community, at least, uh, well, I don't know about the latest ones, but the ones that the disk images that have existed the longest, they were created so people could run, run stuff on DriveWire. Is there, is there, do you have any opinion or influence or insight about this culture of disk images? that DriveWire has uh, shepherded or something? Yeah, exactly. Built like, up. in what way, like, do I think DriveWire is responsible for that? No, well, I mean, <laughs> did, did DriveWire create the culture of disk images? Uh, did it somehow contribute to how they're created? To, so, for example, uh, Coco SEC has, can support different disk images, mm -hmm. including ones that are very precise and can re replicate. Right. Um, uh, DMK and so forth, yeah. That sort of stuff. Uh, some emulators supported either the same images or different, uh, similar uh, images. Mm -hmm. um, whereas DriveWire couldn't do it anyway because it right. didn't have the hardware. Right. Do um, you think that's an impact? Is there anything significant about that? Or um, well, you thought about it? Disk images were around before, as you indicated, right? So it wasn't a new idea. I don't know if DriveWire influenced it. I think. I think what happened is DriveWire didn't require the overhead that was in the floppy disk, you know, uh, sector information that kind of tags along with the DMK file format. I think, if anything, DriveWire may may have popularized or gave people the imagination that hey, I've got this floppy disk here that I could, you know, slurp the contents off of and put it on. So maybe it accelerated the idea of disk images. It certainly didn't cause it to happen because it was already happening before, but I think it accelerated and I think it made people realize how easy it was to, to serve them up. So yeah, I think it had some, some uh, impact on that, yeah. Cool. Yes, sir. Has the Python implementation superseded the Java? Yeah, the Java implementation is stale. It, it's just old and it hasn't caught up with the changes in Java itself and uh, some incompatibilities. Yeah, I would say the Pi Drive Wire is the way to go. I think the Java uh, repository, I think, is actually broken too. If is it? Yeah. You, want to build it, you have a lot of extra work to do other than just run and make or whatever. The specs are still up on the, on the Drive Wire site that Aaron hosts, but that's it. Specifications are there. You had a question, sir? 
Yeah, I saw a slide that had Atari and Apple on there. Are there other clients that? Well, the Atari uh, icon that you saw was because of the Liberate 09. Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of any Apple uh, clients. Apple on that slide? I guess it's a general question. Do you know of other? I don't, and I'd love to find that out. Uh, I know the slide you're talking about. Is there it? is something. I just passed it up. To family ADT Pro. Yeah. yeah, there's other technology. I don't know if they use your protocol to develop it. What does that say? Apple. Yeah, I, this is something Aaron put in the drive wire for. I really don't know. I haven't really never noticed it up to this point. Yeah, it's also supporting on the FPGA, which has its own serial port that's not a bid bang port. So that's another thing I forgot to mention too. And of course, simulators support drive wire. So yes, sir. Could you comment on? on I had a some I had a slide that I took out because I thought it was too technical for the talk and I should have left it in there that showed some benchmarks in the graph. So um, formatting a disk was much quicker because obviously it's a two pass uh, process with the real floppy disk. The backup was slower. Like if you backed up, that was kind of one of the ways to benchmark it, right? If you did a backup from uh, zero to one. Uh, it was a little slower. It loading up programs were slower, but you know you kind of gained a little bit of benefit because you didn't have to have a physical head seeking. You could just go get, ask for a sector, and it was there. Uh, at 115.2, it got a little better. It wasn't a total 100 percent increase in, uh, in or decrease in time because it, there's still some overhead. And another thing I forgot to mention is that Darren Atkinson actually came out with some bit routine, some uh, bit banging routines that brought the bit banger up to 230.4 kilobits per second, which is twice 115.2. But those were somewhat unreliable, and it required a special modification of the drive wire cable using the CD line on the four bit port of the bit banger. I never used it. I just I just preferred to to use the 115 and felt it was more stable. Uh, but what's interesting is that um, things like the FPGA can run much faster. So you're not limited technically to the serial ports to, to 115 too. You can go as fast as any serial port can go. Uh, even Mark has even designed some hardware that uses the drive wire protocol to talk between devices on a bus. So it's, you know, there's the protocol which defines the bytes and the, and the transfer mechanism. So, um, but anyway, back to your question about floppy disks, a little bit slower, but you didn't have to have a floppy drive. You didn't have to have the cost of having a controller. You know, you could homebrew this thing pretty easily, and that was the big attractiveness of it, I think. So you sacrificed a little bit of speed for that. <coughs> yes, sir. So uh, did you, while you were still visiting that cottage in Massachusetts, did you achieve the dream of not bringing one across the floppy drive? I did, yeah. It took a little bit of time, but I did. And, and, and what I was doing is I had gotten it working pretty early on, but to really productize things at Cloud9, we wanted to write a manual. We wanted to test it out. We wanted to make sure that, you know, it worked. And even, you know, I'm pretty good at 6809 assembly language, but uh, Darren's routines that came out in DriveWire 3 were, were just doing even more clever stuff than I was. And so there were a couple of things that would, you know, a couple of times that you get these weird timing issues where it would time out with the DriveWire 2 product even, that I'll admit, I just didn't think about doing it the way Darren did. And Darren's code shrunk it up and tightened it up. So yeah, I... Um, I got it. I achieved the dream at the place. So the other question I had was, uh, when I first heard you the drive wire, it was really a set. Yeah. That came in DriveWire 3. Uh, that was, and that's part of, by the way, DriveWire is all open source. It's on part of the Toolshed project, which is on SourceForge. Uh, those, so the idea there was if you really, really wanted to, you know, strip away not even have a burner ROM and make your own ROM cartridge, you could create a cassette and there's a cassette file. So I take HDB DOS, make a cassette file with the cross tools on PC or Mac or whatever, and you could load up a wave, it's a wave file or you could put it to a real cassette and basically, you know, wait 35, 40 seconds to load up the DOS on there and boot it up, yeah. 
So there was that, there was a ROM that had HDB DOS, and I even made a, a ROM that went in the motherboard that replaced the basic on the Cocoa that you turn the Cocoa on, it would just go into this, the DW DOS boot. So you could, you know, you, there was like five or six different ways to do it. It was really kind of clever, so. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's a question online from uh, Kevin Phillipson. Mm-hmm. Hey, Kevin. He says, um, can you uh, give more details on how you achieve 115 kilobit mm -hmm. um, on the bank or yeah, so that's a good question. This is a technical thing. It's interesting. I'll try to make it brief. It turns out that um, this 300 baud limitation that was, you know, touted on the Cocoa and the BidBang report was the fact that if you wanted to multitask under OS 9, you had to keep interrupts unmasked for as long as possible. The trick is that you, it's a very cycle-dependent cycle dependent set of 60 to 9 routines that you, you hone in. There's a read routine and a write routine on the BidBanger that it basically you pass in a point or two a uh, buffer and a length and that goes out to the bid banger or you pass in a point or two a buffer and a desired length that you want to read so you write assembly language code that basically bit bangs out at a specific time knowing the cycle the, the cycle rate or the clock rate on the coco uh, that's how I achieve that speed so you converge to a maximum that you can do which was 115.2 right for given Coco 3 that ran at 1.78 megahertz, or half of that for a Coco 2 that ran at 0.89 megahertz. That was your maximum achievable baud rate, you know, within the, the strata of baud rates, 19.2, 38.4, and so forth. So um, that's what I did. And ironically, you know, you think that the faster you go, the more CPU you have to use. Well, that's not the case. The faster you go, the tighter your code has to be. But the advantage is that you can get your data out quicker so you don't have to mask interrupts as much. So the faster you go, the smoother experience you get. So you get a win on that side as well. Good question. Thank you for that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. It's very enjoyable. Appreciate it.